Hello, you are listening to episode 4 of the Men's Voices Ireland podcast. In this episode, James, David, Sarah and Derek Murphy discuss masculinity in Ireland today. What is masculinity? How much of the masculine identity is inherent to men? And how much of it is constructed by our environment and by society? What are the origins of the highly negative, often stereotypical views on masculinity that we see in society today? Could it be that a particular cultural interpretation of masculinity gave rise to the feminist movement over half a century ago? Stay tuned to find out more. The podcast is now available to download on iTunes and you can also listen to it directly on our website at mensvoicesireland.com forward slash podcast. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube at Men's Voices Ireland, follow us on Facebook at Men's Voices and on Twitter at Men's Voices IRL. If you like what we do and you would like to support us in some way, we also accept PayPal donations which can be found in the description of the YouTube video if you're listening to this on YouTube or by going to mensvoicesireland.com and looking at our appeal for funding page. Thank you very much. All right, we're live with the Men's Voices Ireland podcast, episode four. And this time we have myself, obviously, James. We have David and Sarah again. Say hello. 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 Hello, all. And we're also joined by Derek Murphy, who, for the first time, and he is a member of Men's Voices Ireland. Derek uh, has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Trinity College, and he's currently doing a PhD in the area of men's groups, men's issues as well. And he has a long history of working in in men's groups in his personal time. How's it going, Derek? Hello. Hello, James. Hello, Hello. uh, David and Sarah. (laughs) And then All right. Else so let's do this then. We are talking today about masculinity, a very broad topic. And I guess the best thing to do would be to start with the person who is first in the queue on the side of my screen and the control room on this. So Derek, <laughs> since you're our newest guest, you know, okay. there's, a, there's been a lot of uh, sort of, I would say, negativity surrounding the negative connotations, I would say, surrounding um, masculinity. And as somebody who has a background in this kind of psychology and this kind of area, what do you think? What's going on? I suppose it's it's funny, actually, because I just, I returned to working on billing sites. I worked for on billing sites for many years, very masculine environment before I embarked on, on the, an academic journey. And it's kind of interesting to go back into that kind of working class male environment, you know, where where the word masculinity will never be uttered by anyone. You know, it's not something that's questioned in, in those kind of environments. So my experience in Trinity College, especially when I did a lot of family modules and masculinity was delved into, or even fatherhood was delved into. And you're right, there, there was a... Well, first of all, the co- these concepts were dissected endlessly, which which obviously was a new thing for me. And there there is there is certainly a I would say the influence of feminism within academia, where masculinity is seen as something negative. I think men in general there would be a kind of negative slant aimed at men generally in academia. So I think that's a fair comment. I'm not disagreeing. I mean, it, it is it, in academia. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm based in Trinity as well. I'm not even doing a humanities or subject or anything like that. But there was a debate recently, held, hosted by I think the Phil or maybe the Hiss, and it was literally about like, is masculinity bad or harmful? I mean, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be able to have debates, but just would you ever imagine there being an equivalent one done for, you know, femininity? It's never really questioned. As a, is there anything wrong with femininity inherently? I don't think I've ever heard that being done by anyone, never mind by feminists who you think that would be their their jam, you know, self scrutiny and 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 looking at self actualization. What what feminine traits are holding that back? I don't think they do that. Sarah, this would probably be a good point for you to drop in. I guess uh, I'm listening. Well, I don't have much experience of academia. Like I've been a student, I've been a master's student and a degree student, but never in areas of like kind of sociology or psychology or anything. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the idea of feminism is still, I think we said the last time we spoke, it's still growing. It's growing and growing and it's it's finding new, new kind of like paths to 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 creep down and pollute you know it's not getting any smaller so it's not surprising that it's a it's always going to be a hot topic wherever people are 
in the business of reading and thinking and writing because yeah. it's it's an endless it's an endless 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 ocean universe whatever you want to say as long as people are thinking that women are getting the short end of the stick they can find ways to to further that theory and so you know they'll keep going until until we try and stop them <laughs> ho ho well but in specific terms to to masculinity i mean i think that when we're discussing it, we should also try and talk about the, well, the positives of it, because I don't think they get aired enough, at least not anymore in the last 10, 20 years or so. It seems as though there's almost a what do we need it for type attitude. You know, what do you think, David? Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, I, I, I used to think for a long time that, that the attack on masculinity uh, was kind of directly connected with the, the growth of first women's studies and then gender studies, which seems to be a kind of a, a new name for women's studies as we, we <laughs> yeah. on the, uh, yeah. the Cassie, Cassie J Red Pill documentary. You know, they disguised it in that way. But and in fact, um, I, I, I think I've enlarged my idea a, a bit more that it it's not just feminism as such. I learned about something called the standard social science model recently through reading Pinker's book. And it seems that all the social sciences, you know, embody this, this what they call the standard social science model. And, and Pinker talks about three basic ideas which inform this, the so-called standard social science model. And they are the, the notion of the blank slate, the notion of the noble savage and the ghost in the machine. <clears throat> yeah, and, of uh, course, yeah. Yeah, and the notion, the, the blank slate is that, you know, we're all born blank slates and... Uh, Nothing is written. Everything is socially constructed, if you like. It's mm-hmm. put in there by the environment, by by the culture. Then the 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 uh, the noble savage idea is that you know the people in in the wild, in nature, so to speak, were not violent. They were they were actually noble. And um, okay, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, and the, and the violence actually came with with of all things with civilization, if you if you um, if you can believe it, um, and. Uh, then the, the third notion, the ghost in 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 the machine, is that you know this mind body dualism that um, the the mind is is utterly different from from the body. But uh, Pinker um, actually attacks each, all of these notions in. Is this the blank slate, or is the better yeah. angels of our nature? Yeah, the blank slate. It's yeah. in the blank. It's in the, that book called the blank slate. Okay. And yeah, um, that's, he's very he's very known to to. Be very critical of this. I think he's a little bit more sort of favorable to the influences of of biology and and so on as well on on natural tendencies, which are constantly being discounted. I think that's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he 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 puts forward um, enormous amount of um, scientific information, which actually debunks the the three ideas that we've just talked about. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, of course, they, you know, they don't hold hold any water. That they, none of them do. Not, yeah, no, no, they don't. Do. None of them. They are connected with this notion that masculinity is somehow bad because <clears throat> they, they, they try to claim that in, in each of the ideas that um, masculinity is associated with violence and this is learned from the culture. Uh, it's not born. It's not biologically determined. Uh, we are not violent. Uh, we, it, violence is not learned is, is one of the phrases that, that they use. It's one of their key kind of slogans or categorized. Violence is not learned. It's somehow inculcated by the culture and it's inculcated in particular by uh, what what we 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 spoke about uh, this notion of toxic masculinity that masculinity is um just simply uh bad and um is well, they, say, as, they say aspects of it they say that there are aspects of masculinity that are toxic and those are the ones they're trying to end as it yeah. were those are the ones that are trying to cut. Those are the ones that are trying to to end. This is what exploring masculinity's idea is all about, and it's still yeah. going on. In 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 sense, we're we're still we're going through a new rejuvenation of that process. Now, yeah, no notion of talking. People who don't know that was a proposed or even partially implemented program to, to teach, in particular, boys of transition year type age in school about you know the toxic elements of masculinity, the healthy elements. It's very right. ideological, very feminist, agenda driven. You mentioned sort of masculinity being synonymous with violence. I think that's a very interesting thing to discuss because to believe that is, I think we should probably give some credit that, you know, when it comes to things like criminal acts, there's far more likely that it's going to be a male perpetrator, right? When it comes to like things like, uh, you know, robbery, violent crime, uh, muggings and things like that. Yeah. That, is, that is true. But that's not to say that 
it is because of masculinity that they're doing it, which is what's often averred, right? It's the position that they have is that because they have, you know, toxic masculine ideas of using violence to solve problems, blah, blah, blah. That's why they commit crime. No, it's because they're more probably get themselves into more situations that they can't find their ways out of by social means, whereas women could probably find a way of talking about something or asking a favor of someone then men can find themselves down more cul-de-sacs in life i would well, say i would suggest uh, yeah. as just a person with an opinion and out of that can come acts of frustration and violence a man can end up more frustrated with situations in his day in his life i'm sure these days than a woman can because they have less means available to them to find fulfillment. It, to me, it's a no-brainer. Over 90% of the people in Irish jails are men, and it's no surprise because women have greater networks, greater empathy, greater connections, greater openness about what's going on with them. And they're just looked, looked on with more sympathy when something goes wrong. Why I mentioned the violence thing is because reckless behavior or sort of risk-taking behavior is associated sort of inherently with testosterone, with masculinity, right? Biologically speaking. Mm-hmm. So the same bit, the same sort of explainer that can help understand why, for example, young men die by misadventure, do stupid things, maybe do crimes. It also can help explain things like why are the majority of inventors male? Why are the majority of entrepreneurs male, risk takers in, in new fields, even in academia? It's probably similar or the same mechanism, just being applied in a constructive way, right? Yeah, I don't know if I'd call it a mechanism, but I like, yeah, I mean, risk taking or bravery is is supposed to be something that is essentially like a good thing about masculinity, right? Like heroes are mostly men in history, you know, firemen are mostly firemen, <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Fire person, Sarah. <laughs> no. <laughs> fire, fire individual. <laughs> I was at the same party person, today parade of and fire I, saw, I saw, I don't know how many of, I saw any women in the fire brigade part yeah. of the parade. People of fire. <laughs> so Derek, I want to bring you back in a little bit because you have the perspective of somebody who's been in, inside the hornet's nest, as it were, because you're in a very sort of ideological environment doing psychology. Well, you know, I mean, I have to say, you know, because I think it was Dave was talking about how you have this social model. Is that what you call it, David? That's dominant. Hey, standard, social standard, social science. Science. standard social science. Standard social science. I, I would say in psychology, I would say there's a lot of different ideas around something like masculinity, gender. There would certainly be a lot of theories and ideas put forward to say that there's something inherent in these concepts that they're not socially constructed. I think if you go to certain subjects, maybe like uh, sociology, um, you would get, apparently it it is a dominant view that gender is something socially constructed, but within psychology, it wouldn't be. Like Pinker's work is in there, other other people's work is in there. And that's probably one of the problems, as I said earlier on, you know, when you get into normal conversation with people, which I'd say, you know, your, your ordinary man on the street, your own ordinary man on the building site, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have a clue, he, you know, about masculinity. What is masculinity? Because masculinity is just associated with men. You're, you're a man, you're masculine. You're a woman, you're feminine. But when you go into the academic environment, all of a sudden you have so many different ideas. Things are dissected. And dissected and dissected, and, and and you get all kinds of competing ideas. But it's not a democratic place, really. It's it, like this idea of the free marketplace of ideas is not, uh, in my experience, it's not true. What you do find is that you get popular ideas. There's there's popular ideas now, and unfortunately, a lot of them do state that there is something inherently bad about men and yes. fathers and boys. And that needs to be changed. And that men need to be made, you know, it's like femininity isn't dissected and questioned and critiqued. Which I don't think it should be, by the way. I I think that can be, there can be some case made for self-scrutiny, but the way it's done to masculinity, especially with the effects it would have on your voice. I think it's part of the problem. We over-dissect things. We over-analyze things, you know. 
Um, so femininity isn't dissected in, in, in any way like masculinity is. So this femininity kind of like it's like it's like this protected sacred like sacred is a word yeah, that's out of place, it, but that is actually probably is, a good word to use. There is, isn't it? Like, yeah, there, there is that quality to it. It's like there is a there's a grain of truth in every prejudice and every you know in, in so many things that we might disagree with because I've thought long and hard about this. And you know, there's there's ideas out there that femininity really is sacred. There's something yeah. about it's 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 omnipotent that the mother, you know, the mother gives birth to us all. She is sacred. Mm. You don't criticize your mother. That you know? is out there, yeah. Mm. It is. It's a, it's, 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 it's universal. I would say, yeah. There's, it's universal. It's unconscious. You know, it's it's not something we're actually aware of because it's so ingrained in us. It's mm. like the air. It's just the way it is, always has been and always will be. Yeah. But then when you come to masculinity, like I have a great book called Manufacturing Masculinity. Paid £100 for it. For <laughs> and I grabbed I, it. I, I really hope it was good. Then. It, was, it, it was worth <laughs> it. It was worth it because it was bringing in ideas like missing pieces in this you know, massive jigsaw, this very abstract jigsaw that that's in academia. And basically what it's saying is, if you were to distill it down to one idea, is that masculinity is socially constructed. Or at least there's a large element to constructed masculinity that there isn't to femininity. Femininity just is. But, and we all hear it every day, you know, we see young boys trying to prove how man they are, you know, how yeah, tough yeah, they are. You know, whether it's sport, you know, it's an inherent thing in us. I mean, I raised a, a young guy, or I raised two girls as well. And there, there is something about proof of your masculinity. From a very early age, guys are picking up, what do I need to do to prove I'm a valuable member of society? And, and women don't have to do that. So, yes, there is, I believe, certainly an element of, of masculinity being socially constructed. Beauty now, in the nature would, nurture debate that they're both active. I think most people would say, of course it is, because if you don't, you know, if you don't mentor and parent young people, they can go astray, whether they're boys or girls. I mean, if you don't mentor young men, what was that, uh, yeah. that, that, that old proverb about, you know, it takes a village. Yeah. And the yeah. counterpoint to that was, if you don't welcome you know, young men into the village, you know, they'll come back and burn it down. You know, that proverb. down. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'd be a member of a few men's groups. And I, I would look at an organization like the Men's Sheds, for example, as well. And to me, a central theme in, in those organizations is that men crave learning how to be a man. You know, at least there's, there's a actually, sorry uh, to mentoring. I would say mentoring. There's an, an idea that men crave being mentored that there isn't yeah. for women, you know. Sarah, yeah, what but, do you yeah. think? Yeah, no, I'm just, well, first of all, men crave being mentored. Do they? Do they consciously? Well, well, con let, me, let me just uh, kind of expand on that uh, or just clarify it from yourself as well. There's a, I think modern society, I think men have lost a lot regarding, as, as you said, uh, James, there, about the idea of a village, about, you know, the idea of a young boy being mentored by his father, by his uncles by grandfathers we've lost that in modern society or we're certain we're losing it we absolutely and, are yeah, absolutely, yeah it's yeah, gone and there's a big loss there and it's felt by men well women still have their tightness it's an, it's, stuff going it's an, on it's, but it's an essential thing for men this idea of being socially constructed into manhood by your village which isn't necessary for women or at least not as necessary to the same extent so that's where I see men's groups and I'm fascinated by watching young men come into men's groups. The way something very deep is, is ignited in them and, yeah. and watch men's sheds as well. And I think at the, at the center of these things is this idea of men. We're lacking something in modern society and we're trying to make up for it. You mentioned right. all the, the violence and stuff like that and addiction and all that. And I, I believe at the back of that, is this loss that men feel? Men are far more likely, as as you said earlier on, there to end up in prison, mm. to end up on the streets, to end up in addiction. Mm. You know, to kill and be killed. Yeah, without, and I without think good examples. A huge element of that is this this loss that men yeah. feel. That is uh, unconscious. Can I, can I there, though? Yeah, uh, go on, David. Yeah, Dark is seems to be saying that men want to be socially constructed, but by calling upon somebody to mentor them, but. I'm not sure that that's 
what social construction is is in my understanding of I would say that men want to be inducted into manhood and and because it's it's biological I mean something like 50 percent of our um, characteristics are biological biologically yeah, yeah. Um, governed and and what a man what boys are looking for and what has happened what was the case in hundreds maybe thousands of years was that yes boys were inducted into manhood but they were led into something that they wanted to become in the first place by by their biological um, origins and and I, I agree with that Dave and I mean this is why there's you know there's a difficulty in language around all this uh, I was kind of speaking to this dichotomy you get you know around social construction versus essential characteristics yeah, yeah I, they're I, actually I, they're you know they're, they're, it's not that it's not black and white and so when i'm using the term social construction i'd go, i would use inducted equally but it's a natural process it's yeah, not it, something it, you it, can so, do and, it, and, and, and this idea yeah. that you can just that gender is malleable and you can you know you can teach men to be a completely different way to the to their you can what they're you know, teach, te- determined to be well, you, yeah. you know, the, yeah, there's this idea now you can teach men to be very empathetic and to be, you know, to cry and communicate all these, you know, all their angst at the drop of a hat, like apparently women can do. I mean, it's not, gender cannot be manipulated. It, you know, well, no, not, social, with, not with good this, results anyway, not with yeah. a healthy outcome. Absolutely. It's going no, against no, nature. Yeah. yeah. No, so no, it's, it's not. And it's so, that's about. where you come back again. I mean, that, that, uh, yeah, I mean, they need to be careful yeah. about the use of the, of the language. I mean, social constructionism to me is 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 has become used almost in an arbitrary way. You 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 know you can you can it's associated with the blank slate. The idea that yeah. you know people are uh, have nothing written in, into them that that uh, you know biological bi- biology has nothing to do with social uh, with with gender. This is this is the notion of the blank slate, and biology has nothing to do with gender. In fact, yeah. uh, biologically, ha- biology has a great deal to do with gender, fifteen percent or more. This is why uh, I wouldn't use the term like when inducting a boy into manhood is is the same as social construction. It's very different. It, I think it, it isn't yeah. social constructionism in the academic sense, but I think I understand what Derek means. And the difference yeah. in the two is that classical social constructionism is very top down. It almost implies that there's like some kind of above power who's kind of manipulate all of society towards a particular end. Like we need to construct yeah. all the men into the emotionless automaton so they can go to war. It's there's not, a grain of truth to that, but really it's more ground up. It's with the grassroots, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's why well, the men's sheds work so well. It's because yeah, they are there is another, male spaces from the ground up that are built by men for men. They are, men are crying out for an actual space to be men in and not be judged right. for it. Mm. That's yeah. different, that's yeah. different yeah. to... To purely it being born into them, I don't think so. Definitely influenced by some kind of need for they're responding to their environment, right? Young men know that they have to do in order to be successful. They cannot just be. The reason for that is they don't give birth, they don't conceive, so they are not inherently valuable, biologically speaking, in the same way that women are. So instead, no. they have to become valuable through contributions, and they have to create worth for themselves. And, and- yeah. And, the, and the way they used to do that in the past was by being protectors. And providers, indeed. Mm. And providers. Yeah, but that's, that's not right. needed anymore because we have the welfare state, we have modern industry, we have technology. And because it's not needed, then airy-fairy, highfalutin academics have no problem raising questions like, that's, what do we even need men for? And this kind of thing. That's right. That would that's change why the drop of a hat. Yeah. But I, I mean, I don't agree with you. To say, I, I'm not sure I agree to say that being protectors is needed anymore. Um, oh, it's, sure not, it's not. It, I don't think it is needed anymore. I think it, the psychology behind it may still be present because I don't think women suddenly just stopped wanting masculine men. I heard that from Blind Boy from the rubber band that's recently talking about how we don't need this anymore kind of thing. Um, so men need to stop feeling pressured to be providers. Well, that's all well and good as long as Women aren't looking for men who are capable, masculine, uh, emotionally balanced, and and showing emotional mastery. They are. They women are away. still looking for providers. Sorry, I've been listening, but women... some are. I mean, I'm sure there's not many as there used to be, but it hasn't gone away. You it's know what I mean? still very much there. It's of course it is. Women and and I I would I would venture to be decapitated possibly in town if I say this out loud, but Agua. I would venture to say that. Many women who have 
become working members of society who've gone to college and gone and got as good a job as they can because it's up to everyone in society these days to get as good a job as they can to make as much money as they can or Mm -hmm. to contribute as much as they can the pressure is there for everyone men and women it's not that women have chosen to go I'm going to get a job and push all the men out of the way not at all they have to try their best but I I'd venture to say that many of them would like to find a man whose income could possibly offer them the possibility of taking a bit of time off when they have some babies well, they do know? do that yeah but so you know that so the women, they, women are are still hoping that they will find a partner some of them that will be able to provide them with that backing back into what you could say would be their their natural you know feminine expansion of their mothering person you know so you only like need to look at what we what we actually romanticize in men in in not just in you know real life but also in our stories our myths it's always the same it's always emotional mastery rising to challenges heroism selflessness sacrifice masculinity is at the heart of all of the the traits that well you know what can i come in there because yeah, yeah. um like you know i would like this is not straightforward stuff, and I would say that the portrayals of masculinity that you get from the movies over the last whatever 30, 40, 50 years has been very unhealthy for men. I don't really? necessarily believe they were portrayals of masculinity as some kind of natural way that men need to be. I think they're associated, those ideas are very much associated with American culture, um, yeah. English culture, and certainly. I, I, I don't think they're a, a universal idea of to be a man. Uh, this idea of, you know, there's a lot of chivalry in there, you know, which is... Yeah, I, don't, I, I, think, I think I should probably roll back a little bit on that. I don't mean necessarily to protect women. I think, you know, yeah. they are supposed to protect everybody. I, I would say, like, they're very much connected with Anglo culture, I'd say. Those ideas, they're certainly not universal. There's, if you they look at other cultures... stories. For example... For example, you know, this idea, you think, like I'm 50 years of age and I remember Ireland was, you, you know, when I was younger, Ireland would be very much criticised for being a backward country. You know, it was even called a third world country when I was growing up and men were seen as being very docile, docile you know. This idea of going out and earning a killing every day, earning a fortune, working so hard. It's it's not a universal way to be a man, and and there was there's been a huge cost to that. And I would say, this is where you get the rise in feminism. You know, feminism didn't rise rise in China or Africa or, or even Ireland. It came from America, where men behaved in a certain way and they got a reaction. Explain that. Yeah, I'd like to hear well, what you mean. By that. Well, say you, you know, in America, the white men they would have had. They would would have been this work ethic, you know. You yeah. know, they would have looked down on people like the the blacks and the Irish, even you know. They would, us, they would have called us lazy, yeah. Yeah, it's, lazy. You know, you have this Protestant work ethic, which is all about a man is he shows his uh, devotion to God by earning as much money as he possibly can. I mean, there, there there was an essay written on it, the Protestant work ethic. I didn't read the actual essay, but that seems to be the gist of it. You know that. This particular culture has work at its center. This idea of maximizing, you know, the profits and exploiting other people in the process because, you know, there would have been a, a kind of hierarchy of races in, in this. So it was okay to, to maybe exploit other people. So the men in those environments made an awful lot of money and they had their, what you know, it was a kind of individualistic culture as well. They had... You know, the wife at home raising the kids. And I think the women, now this is just maybe I'm not explaining it right, but just my understanding of it. There was a lot of resentment from the women because they saw their men going off, earning a fortune. You know, like I'm saying, talking about 1950s America, where they had these huge big cars and, and they had money to burn, basically, or even your ordinary Joe Soap. So I think it created a resentment in these women. Others grew up thinking, You'd maybe listen to the, to their mothers complain about their fathers going off and leaving the family. You see, you you have to remember it takes a village to raise a, a child or, or raise a, a boy into manhood. But if your father is gone from seven o'clock in the morning and he doesn't come home at seven o'clock at night, he's not there yeah. for his, 
Yeah, no, you're not there for right, daughters. Yeah. He's not there for his wife. And like I said, America was a very individualistic country. It wasn't didn't have the kind of communities, you know, historic communities that other countries had. So these women were left on their own all day at home. While it seemed, you know, and maybe this was all a pretense. Maybe the men weren't having a ball, you know, but it seemed like they were having a ball. So I think this is where feminism came from. It certainly tallies with the, the you know, feminism did come from America, came from rich white American yeah. women. And I right, think you're right, Eric. You're you know, right. I think the young women watched their mothers being depressed and, and, and determined. They weren't they weren't going to put up with what their mothers put up with. Well, you're, you're actually describing the, the, the Marxist origins of a lot of feminist theory, which we actually touched. I know you didn't listen to the last week's podcast yet, but we actually touched on this before. Right. That it was very tied into the Marxist framework of instead of opposing you know, capitalism or smashing the bourgeoisie, it was instead you know, reframed as patriarchy because most of the source of all that wealth creation within the bourgeoisie would have been you know, male labor, uh, whether it was working class labor or you know, wealthy business owners mm. who are men. So it became, it became a, a Marxist formulation of you know, the oppressed female versus the oppressor. The, the hegemonic masculinity so yes uh it makes sense that it would come from the most capitalist country in the world and it also explains why you know in more third world type countries you need a male support to essentially thrive and survive so then masculinity suddenly is important and it is valued and it's not even thought about that's the point you don't even dissect it because you can't afford to if you're living meal to meal never mind paycheck to paycheck you cannot afford to start saying oh i wonder if this masculine masculine thing is so money is the problem and envy is the problem because that's what it sounds like when you're talking about the board housewives in america they were envying the fact that their their men were out accumulating wealth and then holding the wealth that they then gave to the wives in as much as they wanted to give to the wives well they, well, they had to yeah they but you know what i mean they, would, they the had the wife. purse strings the but men had the, the purse strings the power, yeah. they, yeah, had, they the control, had the control yeah yeah, yeah, and because of money. And like, so I think women, this is again me and my airy fairy notions, which I stand by until someone can tell me I'm wrong and why, and that's fine. But yeah, yeah. women started to think that all power came from money and they forgot the power of, of love and connection and human relationships. And, and kind of, you know, there you go, roll the end credits. That's the problem as far as I'm concerned. Money has taken the place of love as the focus of people's energy. Have you ever read The Myth of Male Power, Sarah? No, but I have it on my list. I I joined the library last week. I think you would very much enjoy it then because it's basically examining that attitude, that power. Yeah, no, the the assumption is is implicit there in what is being said about it going out, men going out to earn money in the US, being individualist, rugged individualist, looking, earning more and more money that, that, um, they didn't share this money with their wives or their family at all. They, they choose to keep most of it for themselves. I'm not sure <clears throat> whether there's much truth in that. Um, what? No, no, um, I don't. Are you saying? Sorry, David. I'm listening, and I'm I'm hearing you say that the the problem was because the men weren't sharing their money with their wives. Is that yeah. what you interpreted from what I said? That's what the implicit. Uh, well, no, I don't know. Well, I, I a lot of what is being said. Sorry, that they didn't uh, share it with with their wives. I'm, no, I'm not sure whether they're listen. That. My my point is, and I could like I haven't a clue I wasn't alive in America in the 1950s, nor have I read much about it. But I would say it wasn't how much they did or didn't give their wives that was the question. It was the fact that it was up to them that they were the ones making it. It was their money first. The wives may have had a limitless access to the bank account and fine, but the wife, as a dependent, was a dependent of this fund. And not yeah. an, a, a not a main maker of the fund, and therefore felt like she was not in the driving seat of her spending power, but rather was a recipient, and you know wanted the power, wanted direct access to the money by making money. Maybe I don't. I think you're maybe right there, um, but it, implicit in in all of this is that you know it the the two husband and wife were not working as a team at all, but that they were working as individualists, and that. Very little was shared. You know, the, the men went off and earned lo- loads of money, which they didn't share with the, with their wives, and that somehow somehow they didn't they didn't partake in the family life. And I just can't believe that that that's really uh, the way it was, um, because 
in my my experience of, of it and when my growing up in, in Ireland is that um men and women work together they they work very hard both both parents work very hard and they work very hard for a common aim and that was to give their children the best possible start and Absolutely. The, everything they shared and there was no such thing as you know this is my fiefdom, they, you know, I'm keeping this money for myself. <laughs> no, absolutely not, that was, no. That wasn't the experience at all, you know? No, I'm not very, I'm, if you're, I'm hearing that you're thinking that that's what I believe and it's not. It's that sure. money makes people greedy. Yeah. And being yeah. a dependent of a person, even if you love them very much, but if they are the person who's generating that pile of gold, I could see how people want closer access to the pile of gold or want their own, want to yeah. make their own. Because the difference between yeah. soft power and, and hard power. Soft power is typically feminine power. It's things like influencing someone who is mm. powerful without being in position. It's things like, you know, if you want to talk about the difference, hard power in politics would be being voted into office. Soft power would be the National Women's Council having the ear of policymakers without being elected into office. Mm-hmm. All of the most powerful advocacy and lobby groups uh, and gender issues are women's groups. They have their fingers in a lot of different pies and they have a lot of different sources of power, whether it's through the media or through politics. They don't yeah. need to be elected. In fact, it would probably be a disaster for them if things were to become uh, the parity they claim to want because then they would be severely diminished in power. They would actually not be as needed anymore if they did achieve their utopia, which is why I'm highly skeptical when I hear them claim that they want it. <laughs> you know, you don't want to put yourself out of business when you're in a lucrative lobbying uh, field. Yeah, I know that sounds yeah. terrible, but I, I stand over it. I really do. But it's a very interesting idea that, you know, they have this soft access, easy access to power, and it means an awful lot. It means it gives them an awful lot of influence. If you have the access to the Taoiseach's office whenever you want it, that's enormous, you know. But not even just that, like who criticizes things that are either spoken to be for women or that are feminist? Nobody wants to be the person doing that. It's considered, you know, taboo. It's very difficult to do. I mean, I'm not trying to say that I'm a victim or anything, but we get a lot of pushback, a lot of negativity, mm. uh, even just from people, not even necessarily from strangers, even from people I know who think like, what the hell is he up to doing this? Like, because it's, it's, there's such a strong level of propagandizing and influence that you're automatically on the back foot to do what we do. Do you know what I mean? Like that is the reality that we deal with every day when we try and go to the media to have op-eds published or to have articles written, mm-hmm. to have things covered. People don't want to touch it. Sure. That's all soft power. That's not hard power. That's not because the guy uh, in the top position in the company is, is a woman. It is because of the soft influence throughout media, throughout policymaking, and just generally throughout culture. That is the soft touch of femininity. Masculinity is more direct. You know, you can look at it, you can see it straight away. You can see you know, the raw numbers on a, on, a, on a boardroom chair of executives or something like that. That doesn't mean that power is entirely sequestered with those people, though. That's all I'm saying. Mm, yeah, I, I kind of wasn't sure where that was going for a minute, but I, I would definitely be with you on the point that women women's power can be invisible and background and no less powerful for that yes absolutely yeah sure yeah sure yeah god like the women the women can can talk the men gently and lovingly into pretty much anything the lady my friends of the world are, are still there you know they're they haven't gone away it's you know it's women have the yeah we have the persuasion we have the we have the kind of the ability to to kind of to talk men around for sure like that's you know well old. isn't it isn't it you know doesn't it come back to balance and and I know we we touched on balance on one of the earlier podcasts and what I was trying to get at I don't know if I explained it as well as I wanted it you know in in the US. You know, with the power of position of white men in America for many decades, mm. you know, it created an imbalance in America, um, as we know, but also in the family home. So the men became too powerful. Um, and so what, what you're talking about there, what you're touching on there, James and Sarah, is that, you know, men and women complement each other. Yeah. You know, we are supposed to be in balance with each other. Women operate a certain way and men 
operate a certain way. Men, as you you know, as was said, we know we we go out and we we you know we go to the external world. We we provide and protect and 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 do that kind of stuff. If aggression is needed somewhere, we we do the aggression. You know, so we have that power then by by virtue of the fact that we have that extra strength. But women have different attributes. Mm. Yeah, it's like that film. What was it called? My big fat Greek wedding, where the okay. housewife. I haven't seen it. Though. I haven't seen. Have it. you haven't? Yeah. Well, the daughter apparently wanted to do something, and the father was dead set against it. And the wife was sympathetic to the daughter, and she says, "I'm going to work on your father. Don't worry." You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she says, "He may be the head of, head of the household, but I'm the neck that moves the head." Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know behind, that's, behind every great man, that saying yeah. as well. These, these, these things are Absolutely. really old. They are not. They are not said for nothing. You know, those memes don't yeah. exist. For Absolutely, nothing. Absolutely, and you know, the men. It's like um, you know, we are different, and this idea, like I say, in academia, you're getting all this dissection and this abstract theorizing and all the rest, and all of a sudden, nobody knows actually exactly what they're talking about. You know. But in the real world, you know, men are associated. Fe- masculinity is associated with men. No way. And femininity is, <laughs> no. is associated with women. End of story. Why dissect the end Yeah, yeah, leave it you know? at that. Let people leave be natural. That, you know? But yeah. you know, we'll, so do, we'll do one on femininity next week. Don't worry. We'll dissect the hell out of it. You know? <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, really. But, but it's this idea people. of of us complementing each other, you know. Yeah. And I think problems arise when there's a fracture in that relationship if men become too powerful or too weak um are are, are doing something against their nature mm. and ver- vice versa i think that's where you have problems and i think like that's maybe what i was trying to get at with america i think feminism certainly came from america and feminism is not the, the you know feminism feminism is not the cause of all these problems where no it's a response to the environment the response mm. you know it's a it's, yeah. an, it's a post industrial response ideology. To this imbalance. You know, it's a response to this imbalance. You, you know, for every action, you're going to get a reaction. And at the heel of the hunt, it's this imbalance, this lack of harmony between the genders. Yeah, because money stuck its oar in and has been growing in oar size ever since. Like I'm oversimplifying, possibly, but it's I've been thinking a lot about this stuff recently and. To me, as simple, I, I don't know exactly what the origin of the yin and yang symbol is. I think, is it just about balance or harmony in any context? But if I think good about evil, it, I think, but yeah, good I and evil, well, it could be used for any, any, any situation where there's two things that need to exist mm-hmm. and need to be well. And it is, fo- it is associated with gender as well. Yeah, is it? the yin yeah. and the yang. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, say the, the, I don't know, one the one on the left is has been always female and the one on the right has been male. And this is a, a pie chart of function. You know, women mm. are, fe- the female of the human species has been mm. expanding its function. And the pie chart is still only the same size, but it's squeezing the other side of the yin yang so yeah. that it can't, be healthy you know women's functions have been expanding so much that the within that circle the the masculine the male half of the race of, is mm-hmm. is squashed is and is therefore frustrated is banging its head off every wall as you know what i mean yeah. it, it, it makes total simple sense mm-hmm. in my head it's very simple that's it yeah, yeah. in a nutshell yeah yeah. I don't know what are we going to talk about femininity at some point in the future, but I think it's a very noticeable feature today that women are going into boardroom, becoming chief executives, and they are wielding the axe as lustily as any male executive ever did. You know, they're, mm. they're, yeah, they're yeah. good for that. The you know, good well, on them. I don't have any problem with that. No, but this this means that they're not being feminized, if you like. Um, and they're also entering getting into sports like uh, violent sports like boxing martial, yeah, right. martial yeah. arts mm. all of those uh, even <laughs> even rugby I mean is a pretty uh, example it's a military um, sport so yeah it, it was masculine right. as well sure. so, so they're, 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 they're out to show they can outdo the men in, in any endeavour whatsoever so wh- how does that impinge on femininity I, I'd like to know uh, how you know, do they interact yeah how would I, 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 I don't know is that being true? Is that being true to the feminine? I don't know. 
Um, I think, I think it is. I think it is. I think it, I, I think it was Glenn Poole who does a lot of good stuff on on men's activism. I'd actually like to have him on sometime. But he was talking about some artist. I can't remember the guy's name, but a British artist. And his thing that he would do would be to, as a performance artist, would be to dress up in like a dress. And people were talking about this like it was some kind of revolutionary gender act or something. But he basically just said, no, it, he's masculine no matter what he's doing. Right. Uh -huh. he, if he's wearing, you know, traditional male clothes, he's a man in male clothes. If he's wearing a dress, he's expressing his masculinity as a guy in a dress. It's not that he's become somehow becoming feminine just by uh, adorning himself in something associated with femininity. And in the same way, like just because a woman is wearing pants, so that used to be a very defiant act, right, to not wear a dress or a skirt. Mm. Now no one cares. I mean, it's, you're still a woman. Yeah, you yeah. haven't changed anything about yourself. You're just attempting to perform an external representation that is associated traditionally with the other gender. People call that gender now. It's that facile of a discussion. They call, you know, behaving in a way that would be stereotypically masculine when you're a woman. Maybe you're not actually gendered female. Maybe you're bi gender, a gender. I don't know all these different words they have for it. But to me, it's just you're a woman. Uh, we're doing something that men typically do, but you're still a woman. Do you know what I mean? We're coming at it from a totally different point of view to the to the modern, largely ideological left wing uh, portrayal of gender, where it can be so loose and airy fairy that it doesn't mean anything anymore. I'd like to come in here and just maybe return to something that you know is very popular and is, and is talked about. You know, this idea of masculinity being toxic, um, being bad. You know, yeah men being over violent yeah. not being able to communicate their emotions or you know their their soft side or, or whatever um being too aggressive and um, those kind of ideas they are a real problem you know and, and you know there's a lot of talk now you know about changing men yes which, which is you know which terrifying is, which is <laughs> terrifying you know but it, you know the, the talk about changing men is there for a reason because there is an issue there is an issue with, you know, male suicide, as we know. Mm. There's a lot of men taking their life. They reckon about 10 men are taking their life every week in this country, you know, mm -hmm. which is yeah. horrendous. Something you know? like that, yeah. It's horrific, you know. Uh, the amount of addiction, you know, and there is this, there's, there's a problem here. Now, I certainly wouldn't frame it in terms of toxic masculinity. No. Um, this idea that men have kind of, you know, repress themselves in order to be macho and, uh, and all that, you know, as if it's, you know, as if it was some kind of choice men freely made, you know. So I, I, would, I wouldn't frame it the way it's currently being framed, but there, there is a problem, you know. At the end of the day, I mean, I have a young son now who, who's 14 years of age and he plays an awful lot of Xbox in his room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and this is very common. I mean, we know a couple of psychologists, Zimbardo and um, Warren Farrell, do a lot of work on this idea of, of boys isolating themselves, you know. So there is a real problem here yeah. um, around men. Yeah, um, but isn't that problem, Dar Darak, isn't that problem created by the, <laughs> the way men have been isolated and they've been neglected and ignored in, in, in the current society? Isn't it, isn't it a, a reaction to, to that? It is, it, it's definitely a reaction. Media. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely a reaction. There's a lot but, of but, men's but rights not, guy. I know, but it's not their fault. It's not their no, fault. No, I'm not saying it's their fault. I mean, there's a lot of men's rights people who say this is the fault of feminism. I wouldn't go along with that. I would. Um, I, totally I, I don't think so either. I, 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 don't, say, I, really, I really don't think I'd, so. You know, I'd say there's, there's an element there, certainly, you know, there's there a lot of, well, I mean, well, I came well, across well, a few yeah. feminist ideas, you know, that horrified me and, and, you know, to see them being inflicted on young boys just absolutely horrifies me, you know. Things like exploring masculinities and stuff like that, you know which will make matters a lot worse. But there is an issue here, and I feel very strongly about it, that, you know, there is an awful lot of young men taking their life. There's an awful lot of boys and men that have said to me and, and said it in environments such as men's groups, they don't know what it means to be a man today. They don't know their position in society today. Yeah. But and that's they, horrifying. You know, who knows their position and, and, in society, to be honest now? Sorry? Who knows? Who knows? Like you could you could talk to a bunch of young girls and ask them, do they know what it is to be a woman? And 
they could have a but hard Sarah, time. You see, I'm not, Sarah, I'm you not know, disagreeing you, with you, but I'm just yes, saying. But, but you see, this the, the difference between the genders, and this is what I spoke about earlier on, and I don't know if people agree with me or not. There's an inherent insecurity about being a man in the world. That's just yeah. the way it is. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way it is. The, the, the female is omnipotent. She's at yeah. the center of life. So her position, she has a, 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 a much more solid psychology from day one and, and position in society. Her position is always, you know, secure, protected. respected and protected. The yeah. men's isn't. So sure. when, when men have lost this natural socialization, into being a, a, a member of society and woven into the fabric of society, mm. when they have lost that, that's a real problem. Mm. And that, that's yeah, what I'm getting at. So, it, where is it coming from, Dara? I mean, where is it coming from? Yeah. Well, I mean, what's the, is there? Are you saying that can, can you pinpoint areas where this there there is a fault and where, whereby men have lost that uh, feeling of we don't know where we are anymore, we, we know what our role is anymore? Can you say? Where, where uh, what is, is there a an underlying reason for that? What is there a fault? In well, society? Because, because I think we're coming towards never, the end of the program. Ever, so ever, the big nobody question, ever talks about it. Nobody, no, I mean, no, nobody, nobody ever talks about it. it. Um, nobody talks except, about it because they, they they say that men are, are you know you're to blame with your own for your own problems. This is what what's men are, are absolutely blamed. And and this idea, you know these feminist yeah. ideas that come in you know and you know, their their own the problems. ground from underneath. Yeah. And men, you know, in this position is horrendous, you know, men being blamed for their own problems. It's horrendous. It's not true, you know. Um, so, so it's a big question. Where does it come from? I think ultimately, you know, it, it comes from ideas like what I was trying to express about making work, you know, the be all and end all of, of life. And, you know, this, you know, it's probably controversial to say it, but this Protestant work ethic. Work. Yeah, there's nothing, like, there's oh, no harm. Listen, like, oh, there's no oh, harm. Everything oh, is about money. It affects you know? both men and women equally. It, it doesn't. It only affects men. That's the problem. So you haven't explained anything there. Well, hang on now. Let's let's be clear about something. We was mentioning about, about video games and retreating from society. Well, video games. I don't. Know, maybe you guys aren't that familiar with them. I certainly am. They are actually almost like tailor made to appeal to masculinity. They can be competitive. They can in a controlled environment of success prestige, status, a sense of achievement and purpose. They're fun. And then what's the alternative? It'd be maybe a world they don't really feel that they fit into. It can be like a controlled environment to be successful and part of a community. Mm. So this is what, and, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence as well that we're at a record, you know, constantly breaking a record for a number of single parent families, most of which are headed by women. So there's also a, a lack of sort of maleness in general and male role models, and male role models. so yeah. you have a way to be in a masculine environment a very male space because gaming especially online competitive multiplayer gaming is a very male space similar to sport mm -hmm. it's a sense of achievement and purpose and yeah the tying into education feeling that it's kind of pointless falling out of interest in it and also you know we're in a post-industrial society we're heading into a services society a much more female friendly one where just mm. a simple you know, the inherent features of men being physically stronger or, and having emotional mastery and dealing with severe hardship aren't valued. They're not really as important mm -hmm. anymore. They're just considered yeah. as being associated with the working class. People say the working yeah. class, they really are referring to jobs that are still almost all done by men, but they don't think of it as a men thing. They think of it as a lower class thing. Everyone must go to college and be, uh, you know, the boss of those people because they don't, want no one wants their kids to to be uh doing those jobs so it's a very complicated thing and i don't think it can be pinned on any one particular ideology or one particular you know culprit but i think uh at least some of it can be simply explained by the fact that we are transitioning into and we have transitioned into a society in which the natural tendencies and and traits of men aren't flourishing and are maladaptive to what we have mm -hmm. And they're finding ways to have their needs met in the, like, I love Maslow's pyramid sense. In, Maybe. In, in, young guys are, are finding ways to get their needs met in computer games. So they're opting into a world where they get that satisfaction, achievement, challenge, all of those things. It yes. makes complete sense. And then there's porn addiction as well, which I don't know too much about. But it's, again, it's an opportunity to get a need 
met without yeah. having to go out and socially strive for it in a in an old fashioned way. Well, so, you're so expected if you're a man or a young a young man to make the first move. That's still almost universal, I think. In my experience, it certainly is, even with 40 years of feminism. So I don't think it's ever going to go away. Um, and yeah, why would you again? Why play that game if you can just retreat? again inwardly but look i don't think there was ever anything wrong with men and their emotions but the society we live in these days has left little comfortable room for being okay with who you are if you're not fitting into boxes that suit i don't know yeah. money making or other people and i loved one thing i loved in that film was the the warren what's warren the farrell farrell <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Warren Fowle. Doctor, Doctor Warren Fowle. Doctor Warren Fowle. Thank you, Doctor Warren Fowle. Um, that you know that women complain about seen as being seen as sex objects, but that men are no matter what seen as success objects. That's yes. a massive yes. statement, and it sits in so well to all of this. Yeah, he's very good at pointing out the the the, the, the binary, town the binary, by book. Uh, the, the, yeah, the 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 um, the the double thing or the lack of double. Yeah. Uh, Lack of straight thinking, yeah. Are we going to get on to femininity at some stage? Or are we going to go to... <laughs> Not today. The other thing that I Not today. Really did That's Maybe we'll do it, David. Gender, gender studies is the one that I, I, I raised last time. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we could do a poll on what people would like to see in the next episode. I want to get going just... on gender studies, James. Uh, I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> Well, let's do it. Let's talk about gender studies. I mean, I need to do a little bit of research because I'd have to dig up some old stuff I was reading about it. But basically, you know, you can just ask them and they'll tell you. Give them the rope and they'll hang themselves adequately. Could you ask someone in from Trinity from gender studies? Do you really think that they'd want to talk to me? Well, you know, it, they should. No. I mean, I've tried to contact the Gender Equality Society in Trinity and offered to give a talk. And they, you know, they were like, we can't accommodate you. Yeah. So I was asking them to, like, you know, put me up in the Ritz Hotel or something. But uh, <laughs> no, they're all very ideologically motivated. Yeah. And uh, they're all, you know, hyper feminist, uh, uh, I'd say radical feminists. Okay. Well, which is I mean, hilarious, I mean, you know. It's just the way it is. Like, there's, and I don't mean every single one of them, I just mean 99% of them. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but like, that it's gender, it's all about gender equality, but they can't accommodate them at the one, one men's voices. The one group, the one person on campus, actually. Yeah. <laughs> me, the single person. Yeah. yeah. No, it's just, it's just too much. Yeah. No. Uh, they're they're not interested in a debate and discussion. They're interested in their own hegemony. So yeah, yeah. I would say unless I can get someone who's open minded enough to to a debate, um, but then they probably wouldn't be in that department anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, right, let's so stop insulting people. Come on, <laughs> switch it off. You need to salvage this podcast with the final word on on masculinity in Ireland today. No pressure, so. Well, no look, pressure. I, I enjoy it. This is the first uh, the podcast I've done. I think this is this is a very very important issue, you know, for for men and for especially for people with young with boys. And uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of concerns out there among you know about boys. I think anyway. Um, so maybe we'll return to it at some stage because, as a couple of people said, some of the issues we talked about are the way we came at some of the issues around masculinity it's not happening out there there's there's a way of coming at men and masculinity which is you know a very you know really a feminist perspective and the kind of views that we have and you know if you had people like mark mccormick and people from the men's sheds we have a way of coming at this issue that is very different and it's very grounded in our own experience of being men which i think is where you get uh, the best kind of knowledge from yeah so hopefully we'll return to this issue in the future because i certainly am very interested in it yeah absolutely great so i think next time we'll talk about gender studies and have a nice conversation about that uh lovely topic <laughs> but for now we've done well longer than we probably should have and uh anyone listening thank you very much uh, everyone should say goodbye okay God, yeah, it's really an hour. Okay, and a half. thank you. Oh, okay. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. And see you soon. Bye. Bye.